This video is about the independent front suspension for the Toyota 120 and 150 platform. Whether you are lifting your truck for the first time, or you are a seasoned wheeler who is looking for more technical info, you'll find something useful. In this video, I tore off the entire front suspension of this GX460 and built it back component by component. I also did a comprehensive suspension travel measurements to understand the true potential of Toyota's IFS design. In the end, you will gain a holistic understanding how this suspension works, a lot of useful data, and know what to look for when you lift it. Hi, welcome to Tinkerer's Adventure. I'm Kai. When it comes to lifting the Toyota IFS, most people focus on the what, what size lift, what brand and model. It is very hard to get a well-rounded answer because there are too many variables and different needs. Therefore, I created this two-part video series that focus on the why and how instead. By truly understanding the principles and mechanisms, one can make their own decisions through reasoning instead of anecdotal opinions. This is part one video where we explore the construction and limits of the Toyota IFS. In part two, we will check out additional details about aftermarket suspensions. To keep this video organized, I divide it into three sections. Suspension constructions and why each component exists. This paves the road for the more technical discussions later. Suspension travel, limits, and how these components work together. At last, we segue to aftermarket suspensions and preview some of the questions we will answer in part two. And let's get started. On a high level, the suspension attaches this wheel to the vehicle chassis, so it suspends the weight of the vehicle and allows some up and down movement. Right now, there's nothing here, so let's rebuild the front suspension and see what's involved. This wheel carries part of the vehicle weight. It also needs to rotate freely as the vehicle moves. Therefore, the wheel is attached to the wheel bearing pressed inside this wheel hub. The hub is then attached to the spindle which create additional mounting points for the rest of the suspension. The only relative motion between the spindle and the wheel is rotation. They cannot move in any other way. Therefore, for ease of viewing, I will remove the wheel and carry on with just the spindle. We want the wheel and spindle to move up and down over bumps. We do not want it to move side to side or front and back. We also want to keep the spindle in the upright position and not tilting over. Therefore, we attach the spindle to the frame through a lower control arm and a upper control arm. Each arm has two frame pivots that allow up and down motion but prevent translating or tilting in other directions. They basically control the path of motion of the spindle into this one defined trajectory. That's why they are called the control arms. And because both arms are shaped like the wishbone of a turkey or the letter A, this type of suspension is called double wishbone or double A arms. In addition to moving up and down, the front wheel also needs to steer left and right. That's why the upper and lower spindle attachments are both ball joints. The steering axis is an imaginary line connecting the upper ball joint to the lower ball joint. As you can see, it is not perfectly vertical. We'll come back to steering axis later. To actually control the steering from the steering wheel, we need to connect this point of the spindle to the steering rack through the tie rod. The tie rod plunges in and out, pushing or pulling the spindle to steer left and right about the steering axis. This is why the spindle is also called the steering knuckle. With the components we have installed so far, we have fully defined all paths of motions of the spindle, up and down plus steering left to right. Next, we need to handle the weight of the vehicle and suspend it somewhere in the middle of the travel. To handle the static weight, we need a coil spring. To handle the dynamic forces and settle the oscillations, we need a shock absorber. For most double wishbone suspensions, the coil spring is assembled over the shock absorber for ease of mounting and space saving. This coil over shock assembly is called a coilover or a strut. The top of the coilover is attached to the coil bucket of the chassis. And the bottom of the coilover is attached to the lower control arm. One important concept I want to introduce here is the motion ratio. The lower control arm pivots about the frame bushings. The wheel is mounted near the outer ball joint, but the coilover is mounted somewhere in the middle. So the lower control arm acts like a lever. Divide the bushing to coilover distance by the bushing to ball joint distance, you will get the motion ratio. For Toyota trucks, I measured 0.54. 
for simplicity, let's call it 1 to 2 motion ratio. What it means is if the ball joint moves 1 inch, the coilover only needs to move half an inch. At the same time, if we have 1,000 pounds of force on the ball joint, the coilover needs to supply 2,000 pounds to react. As you can see, there is a lot of load going through this lower control arm. That is why it is much beefier than the upper control arm. The upper control arm is mostly to keep the spindle in an upright orientation. Therefore, it experiences much less load. To prevent the tire from crashing into the fender, a rubber bump stop is mounted on the frame, which stops the lower control arm from traveling any further upwards. One important component I'm skipping in this video is the sway bar. The sway bar has very high impact on actual off-road performance. Because of that, I am making a separate video just to talk about sway bars for our Toyota trucks. Should you remove them, how much difference is a KDSS versus a regular sway bar? There's gonna be a lot of information that may actually surprise you, so stay tuned for that. Now this concludes all the components for our Toyota independent front suspension. Let's move into the next section and see how they all work together as a whole. Suspension travel is very important for both high-speed off-road and slow-speed crawling. Toyota claims 7.88 inches of travel in its literature. This number is decent for an IFS 4x4 this wide. To put it into some context, this is exactly the same as the new base model Ford Bronco. But how much do we actually get in the real world? Let's do our own measurement and see how it exactly plays out. In this measurement, I removed the coil spring, otherwise I would jack up the chassis. I also added a CV axle with no boot to see how close it is from binding. For due diligence, I repeated the experiment, but by measuring the distance from the tire to the fender. The largest difference between the two sets of data was only one eighth of an inch. So I'm fairly confident our measurements were fairly accurate. The maximum droop is limited by the length of the shock and the maximum compression is limited by the bump stop. The bump stop has some compression, so it is not a definite hard stop. If I stop right when I touch the bump stop, I measure 6.0 inches of travel. If I keep compressing, I started to jack the chassis off the lift. If I stop right before the chassis lifts off, I measured 6.9 inches. With the available static weight sitting on the bump stop, I could not compress it further, so I removed it. I was then able to achieve the advertised 7.9 inches of travel. At this point, the shock still have about 0.6 inch of additional compression left, so we did not bottom it out. Nothing is binding, but the inner CV joint is at the edge of falling out. If we come back and measure the bump stop location, we found Toyota basically assumed compressing the rubber portion of the bump stop from 3 quarter down to 1 eighth of an inch. I tried compressing it with my 20 ton shop press, and it didn't feel easy. So in the real world, it will take a hard bottom out to fully compress the bump stop to achieve that advertised 7.9 inch of travel. For slow speed crawling over ruts, 6 to 7 inches of front end articulation is more realistic. Note, a front sway bar will drastically change how it actually performs, but that's the topic for another video. The total travel is important, but how it's split into up and down travel from ride height is even more critical for real-world performance. Both up and down travel have their irreplaceable roles. Very generally speaking, high-speed racers is in favor of more up travel, and rock crawlers are usually biased to down travel. Nevertheless, a well-rounded setup typically retains at least 30% of the lesser travel. When I measure from factory ride height, we have 3.8 inches down travel and 4.1 inches of up travel, so pretty much right at the middle. When you lift your IFS, Unless you have some sort of extended travel setup, more on that later, you're simply changing the static equilibrium point within the same travel. If you gain in 2.5 inch ride height, you're essentially losing the same 2.5 inch down travel and gain 2.5 inch in up travel. The total travel did not change. Now we are left with 1.3 inches of down travel or 16% of the total travel, which is very suboptimal. This is why most lift manufacturers advise not to exceed 3 inches of lift because you will have no down travel left. This not only creates poor off-road performance, you will also feel the harsh suspension top out in daily driving. This is a natural limitation of lifting IFS vehicles compared to lifting those with solid axles like the Jeep Wranglers. And for us off-road enthusiasts, of course we want to find ways to improve. Let's see how we can get more droop out of this Toyota IFS. Currently the droop is limited by the length of the coilover. Let's disconnect it from the lower control arm and find the next limiting component. After removing the lower coilover bolt, 
I was able to droop the hub another one and a half inch, increasing the total travel to 9.4. At this stage, a couple things come into binding around the same time. Right now, it is the upper control arm ball joint ran out of angle and bind, but the control arm is also extremely close to the coil spring. If you upgrade to a larger diameter coilover, that will probably come into contact. The inner CV joints plunges inward, which made the axle shaft extremely close to the housing. Keep in mind, moving the alignment bolts on the lower control arm will change the clearance of all those items. So we must build in some margin for wheel alignment. On the bright side, the lower control arm ball joint, inner and outer tie rod, and the outer CV joint all have more room to go, therefore not binding. From what I see, Backing up the droop by about half an inch is the safe place to be. That is basically adding one inch of droop and have a total of 8.9 inches of travel. To achieve one inch extra droop by motion ratio, we need to extend the coilover by 0.54 inch. And this is basically what extended travel coilover is all about. The exact added length varies by manufacturer, but usually no more than one inch of extra droop at the wheel. Here we have the shock of the extended travel coilover. I have yet to install the lower bolt, so the suspension is at binding full droop. To install this lower bolt, I will need to back off the droop by about half an inch, just like what we found previously. Now you probably wonder, is one inch a lot? It depends on the context. For Jeeps with solid axles, probably not. But for Toyota IFS, that is 13% increase in total travel, 26% increase in down travel with no lift, and 77% with two and a half inch lift. So in my personal opinion, I will always choose an extended travel coilover. For manufacturers that offer both a standard and extended version, they are usually the same price because it doesn't really cost them more to manufacture one over the other. Unfortunately, not enough manufacturers offer an extended travel version. Most of them are the exact same length as stock coilovers. So we just talked about extended travel coilovers which are mostly half an inch longer. Now, what about simply adding a half inch spacer on top of a standard coilover? Doesn't this essentially make them half an inch longer? We'll take a closer look in part two video. We'll also take a look at spacer lifts in general, which has a very bad rap on the internet. But not all spacers are equal. You just need to understand the why and how. We saw how much suspension travel the Toyota IFS is capable of, but that was without a coil spring. How much articulation can we actually get with a complete suspension? We also learn how lifting the right height reduces down travel. But how does that manifest in actual articulation? Would the vehicle just start using more up travel? Or would there be a net decrease in total articulation? I prepare some detailed corner travel index test to simulate a realistic cross axle situation during off-road we will have a direct comparison before and after the lift. You surely don't want to miss that. Upper and lower control arms are two very crucial components for the IFS. But should you upgrade them? There are numerous advertised benefits for aftermarket control arms, which are realistic and which are more of a stretch. I don't want to simply tell you my opinions. Rather, I want to show you why only some of them hold true and by how much. These are part of the questions we will answer in part two video. If you are excited about any of them, make sure you subscribe to my channel so you don't miss that video coming. Now this concludes our part one video for the Toyota IFS. Share this video to a friend who might find this useful. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them below. Thank you for watching and see you in the next one.